Welcome to the Swisspreneur Show, a podcast about startup stories and hands-on learnings from experienced entrepreneurs. My name is Sylvan, and I will be your host. Today, we're in Zurich and have a chat with Mark Burnecker. Mark is a serial entrepreneur and co-founded and successfully sold two companies. We talk about his journey and his latest ventures in the crypto space. On top of today's episode, you can find additional content on our social media channels, so make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Before we get started with the episode, I would like to introduce you to SBB Startup. If you think that your company is a good fit for the Swiss Railways, Get in touch with them or learn more about their startup programs at sbbstartup.com. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time and for having a chat with us here today. It's an honor to host you. Pleasure. And I would like to start with the first question right away. When you sold your first company, usgang.ch, you were 28 years old. How much money did you make with that sale? Yeah, it was a decent uh, six-digit amount, so not... uh, uh, the same numbers people perhaps have in mind when they sell companies nowadays, but it was a very good base to start other things. And besides the money, uh, it's uh, definitely also the experience and what I learned with my first company. I mean, we started in uh, 1999 and we had uh, 3,000 francs of pocket money, the two of us, mm-hmm. Simon and I, uh, the founders of usgang.ch, and we were profitable from day one, literally. So it was a little bit a different time. So with uh, 3,000 francs of investment, <laughs> reaching a seven digit uh, exit in a small Swiss market um, was a nice starting point. That's quite an impressive starting point, I would say. Did you buy anything special or did you invest all of your money in a, in a new company afterwards, Amiando, which we'll t- also talk about? What did you do with the money? Did you buy anything to sort of celebrate this success or did you invest in something <laughs> new right away? Yeah, I'm not a very materialistic uh, person. I even never had a car before I became father and uh, I needed a car because of the kids. So I bought me a nice watch. Uh, That's what I do every time I sell a company, uh, buying a watch. So that's my only luxury. Uh, But besides that, I normally reinvest the money into other projects, other smart people and founders. So for me, that was also exactly uh, what I did with the money out of usgang.ch so it became a little bit the foundation of uh, some of my private business angel uh, activities. You were also a very young founder, you were 20 years old when you started the company. Nowadays the young entrepreneurs they sort of put them a lot of pressure on themselves. They want to create a unicorn success overnight. How was the feeling when you started back in the days with usgang.ch? Was that also present, this sort of pressure to create a huge success in a short amount of time? Or how did that feel back in the days? No, absolutely not. I mean, funnily, I already had another project uh, before usgang.ch. So I published a newspaper in my college um, together, among others, also with uh, Simon, the friend I co-founded usgang.ch with him. So uh, for me, doing something uh, without traditional rules or as an employee of a big corporate um, was something quite natural. So I always had a little bit the desire to do something on my own. Mm -hmm. So uh, also when we started usgang.ch back in 1999, we didn't have a business plan. So we were really quite, uh, yeah, bluntly moving into the crypto, uh, not into the crypto, into the web space, and we wanted to do something we like, so we went out quite regularly. Mm-hmm. So doing something in the nightlife field was obvious to us, but not based on any analytics or traditional uh, research. So it was really quite a, let's say, spontaneous decision. So we were passionate, and we had a strong conviction that the internet is becoming more relevant for young people uh, going out. Mm-hmm. But besides that, we had absolutely no clue. And perhaps that was also one of the reasons why we were successful. So we were not driven by role models or by or any other um, potential uh, uh, company uh, or vision we wanted to achieve. We just followed our own path. And I think that was part of the success. So not just copying something else, but doing something because we were driven. 
what would you sort of recommend to young entrepreneurs nowadays how to handle this pressure? Yeah, I think times are completely different. So, uh, I mean, when you follow the startup uh, uh, magazines and blogs and platforms, you think if you're not uh, already sold a unicorn uh, under 30, you completely missed something. So I think there's a little bit uh, difference between, between uh, real life and perception. Uh, normally also just read about success stories and never about failures. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think the most important thing is that you really follow your passion and you do what you really want to do and not just copy other ones. If you do it because of the money, I think that's normally uh, not the right way because uh, if you're successful, money is a side effect, but it shouldn't be the ultimate trigger. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it's a different, if it, it's a different time, but still I see a lot of hungry, young, passionate entrepreneurs and they uh, have the same mission and are also driven like we were when we were young and started our first company. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think that should be the ultimate uh, motivation to start something. I think that makes a lot of sense. How did you find out about your passion? How did you test it where your passion actually lies? Yeah, I mean, with our first company, um, ultimately, we just wanted to solve a need we had ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you can imagine, back then it was a different time. So our biggest bottleneck was that people were not in the internet back then. That was really our main problem. That's perhaps a little bit different nowadays. But uh, and besides that, we were just missing uh, relevant information in our field in the internet. So we said, let's just do it on our own. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think solving a problem you have uh, yourself personally as a founder mainly in the retail space, naturally, um, that's already a good starting point um, because ultimately then you're your, your own uh, target group uh, and you normally, hopefully if you're not alone, uh, solve a problem uh, which is also existing for other ones. And based on, 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 on this setup, I think you really want to change something because you have the urgency and the needs that something is changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's already a very good uh, motivation and driver. So you solve your own problem and as a side effect, you also solve the problems of other ones. And if you can monetize this issue, then uh, you already have a, a sustainable, profitable case. Absolutely. You also mentioned before that you and your co-founder Simon were pretty convinced that the internet will become more relevant in the, in the party space. And what, what made you feel so convinced about this? How did you sort of evaluate if this is going to happen? Yeah, I mean, even before we were, I think, the only ones or some of the few ones in college here in Zurich which had uh, internet access at home. Mm -hmm. So also a different time. I had a computer and as a goodie, there was a modem uh, in, in it. So I got into the CompuServe network back then, so really in the early days. Mm -hmm with a very old 9600-bit uh, modem which blocked the telephone landlines and uh, okay. you always had to fight with your parents to get some internet time. So if you, if you yeah, moved into this whole new web space back then and you had some open eyes, I think everybody was able to realize that this is a big game changer. Mm -hmm. And like with other technologies nowadays, you always have a lot of people, they think it's uh, useless and there's no real um, case for it. So the sentence that the internet is a temporary phenomenon was definitely something which was quite common back then. But uh, we both, uh, and also I personally, we saw so many uh, valid use cases and so many existing value changes which will be disrupted that it was quite natural to uh, move into the space mm -hmm. and use the new ways or the new technology which were enabled by the digital revolution to transform existing uh, industries. And as I said, as, a, as somebody uh, who went out regularly as a student, we a little bit combined uh, our own needs and activities with these new possibilities of uh, the emerging tech mm -hmm. technology. And a pretty successful company was the result of that. Exactly. I mean, back then, uh, everything organically from scratch. I mean, I think nowadays we would do it quite differently. But as I said, with the learnings out of the first company, um, yeah, everything evolved into 
so more ambitious plan. So mm. that's why I think that's also key learning for me with the first company. I mean, if it's becoming a global worldwide success, that's nice. But I think it's far more also about learning how to build something from scratch. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, as a serial tech entrepreneur, you also have quite a few other opportunities. So I think sometimes you just focus on your business and try to solve a solution, uh, solve a problem and find a solution for it. And then, uh, yeah, everything evolves from there. How would you describe your key learnings that you took away from your first company that you built? Yeah, I mean, one of the main learnings was that uh, to make something really big, you have to be far more aggressive. I mean, uh, in what way aggressive? Yeah, grow faster, uh, invest more into people, scale earlier, scale more aggressively. Mm -hmm. So let's say all the learnings uh, you have after you started perhaps more on an or organic side and perhaps less on a um, venture capital financed uh, uh, side. I mean, as I said, we had our own money, which was quite limited with a few thousand francs and never really uh, thought about putting additional uh, resources into it. So uh, finally, I mean, looking back, it's surprising that uh, we became as big without external funding. So that's perhaps um, one of the key learnings. Also, perhaps uh, in the earlier phase, already have a second tier of people after the founders, where you give far more responsibility. So you can also focus on more strategic things. I mean, that was also definitely one of my key learnings. As a first-time entrepreneur, I wanted to control everything. So I was involved in literally all projects and was a little bit overviewing everything instead of just having smart people around and give them enough responsibility to scale my own time. How did you manage this transition to delegate more and to also let go of these, these tasks that you controlled before? Yeah, I think that's mostly a learning curve. I mean, after, and I mean, looking back, I think uh, as a good founder, you have to find people which are smarter and better than you self. I mean, that's always a big challenge, but uh, as, as soon as you realize that people are doing something better than you, that's the ultimate reason why you should give them uh, these tasks, because they can uh, achieve better results. So I think that's definitely something after you learn that, either on the hard way or just because you, you see it from the outside, um, yeah, which helps to grow faster. Hire uh, and these second tier people or uh, second layer people, they hire other people which uh, also support them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the triggers that you really uh, have A people hiring other A people. So we can not just grow from a business side, but also from a human resources side. That's very interesting. And I'm sure that there are a lot more key learnings um, also coming from your next startup after you sold uskang.ch. You've already been involved with Amiando in Munich and you actually moved from Switzerland to Munich to be involved in that company. What made you actually move out from Switzerland? Was there anything missing in the startup ecosystem or in Switzerland in general that sort of forced you to take this step? Yeah, I would say there were uh, mainly two reasons. I mean, one uh, was quite straightforward. We were uh, six founders back then, so quite a big team, uh, quite a big founding team. And all my five uh, co-founders were based uh, in, in Munich. Mm -hmm. So uh, literally it was quite obvious that I move uh, to Munich and not that they move all of them to Switzerland. Yeah. And on the other side, um, I was always fascinated by the fact that, I mean, uh, with Usgang.ch we started in Zurich. Then we moved into German-speaking Europe. Mm -hmm. So there you have a little bit more than 4 million people. In Germany, uh, you have 80 million people with the same language and same currency and mostly same culture. So doing the same in German-speaking Switzerland uh, is just 20 times smaller, uh, mainly in the retail market, than in Germany. So based on this fact, for me, it was quite obvious that I wanted to uh, do something in a bigger market. And that's why, uh, yeah, for me, it was like a natural next step uh, to try something out, not in my hometown. I mean, as you can imagine, you have to build up everything from scratch. You don't have your existing network and your peer people. 
and multipliers, but that was a good experience that literally without knowing anybody besides my co-founders at Damiando, I moved to Munich and started from zero uh, with the learnings I had uh, based uh, on Usgang.ch, my first company. And I think that was a great, uh, great experience. You mentioned the six co-founders, which seems to be a rather high number for a founding team. How did you make that work and how did you also split the roles accordingly to make it work? Yeah, it's definitely, I would say, perhaps even a, a too big number. Um, on the other side, um, you have everything covered. I mean, normally when you start, like on average, two or three founders, there's not every part covered. Mm -hmm. In our case, with six founders, yeah, you have already enough people to cover all relevant tasks. And ultimately, I think it's all about egos. So if you have uh, six co-founders and four out of them think they have to be CEO, it's difficult. In our case, the roles were already quite clearly defined from day one. Uh, so that's why I think uh, it worked out. I mean, at the end, we had one of the uh, co-founders who left earlier. Um, but I think that's quite a natural development. And I personally also left after we sold the company. Mm -hmm. So out of these uh, six uh, co-founders, there were only four after uh, the acquisition of Amiando, which is still quite a high number, I would say. But um, I think uh, looking back, it was a unique experience. I don't know that many other companies uh, which succeeded at the end having so many co-founders. But as I said, on the other side, you have already enough founder spirit in all tasks from day one, which is also an advantage. And the roles, could you describe what the roles were that you split amongst your team or did they also change over time? Yeah, there was always a certain blurry line, especially because you have so many founding uh, resources from day one. Mm -hmm. I mean, in our case, it was as a tech company, we had a CTO. Uh, most founders, I was not one of them, were able to program. So it was also possible for non-CTO people to support him, especially in the very early days. Uh, then we had a CEO, which is always necessary. I think it's difficult to have more than one CEO because ultimately you have to have somebody also with several uh, co-founders who takes the ultimate decision. And then you have the traditional uh, Divisions. I mean, I was responsible for, for the sales activities. Uh, we had somebody taking care of the whole finance part, so the CFO. Mm -hmm. Then we had a head of uh, business development. And then uh, one founder, which was a little bit in between uh, marketing, business dev and sales. But uh, yeah, at the end, if you look at uh, how a company is structured, I think you can fill it with the traditional CEO, CFO, CMO, CSO, whatever. And yeah, there's always, there are enough C's uh, <laughs> to give to a big group of founders, I would say. Otherwise you could come up with some new good sounding terms, right? Exactly. I mean, the chief entertainment officer, <laughs> which was at Damiano, definitely part of the role of our CEO. Um, yeah, but I, I think at the end, it's less about the number of founders and far more about the uh, dynamics in between the founders and also about uh, yeah also there the passion that everybody's at the same level I mean in the beginning we worked seven days a week then we moved to six days which was already a big discussion uh, which also involved our non-founding people so we had quite a long time where literally the whole company worked uh, also on Saturdays uh, without any pressure but that was that was, that was just uh, yeah, the spirit we had. And then when we moved from six to five days, that was already like a big game changer because mm -hmm. at this level, we also hired traditional people. So they were perhaps not uh, willing to work six days a week. So there you see also a little bit how the pure startup crazy working mode evolves into a more long-term sustainable uh, uh, setup. Mm -hmm. which is also, I think, essential because you can't work seven days a week, at least productively on a regular base. Um, but we went through all that uh, at, at Amiando. How did you manage to, to keep healthy during that time? I mean, working these long hours and six days a week, I can imagine that puts a lot of stress on your body, but also 
uh, psychologically. Yeah, I mean, we were younger back then. That definitely helps. And uh, I mean, we had a lot of side activities together. So normally, I mean, it was not that we'd spend all the time together, but there were a lot of social interactions together with our employees um, because some of them, like the founders, spend most of their time in the office. Uh, there were also a lot of very close friendships in between. So it was far more than just a, a job. It was a little bit like a, yeah, a mission of, of the whole, especially in the early days of the whole company. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it didn't really feel like uh, working all the time. And I think that's definitely a big difference. We were in the event business. I mean, we did ticketing for conferences and other uh, events. So we were traveling a lot. We attended a few very unique events because we were a partner uh, for the ticketing service. Mm -hmm. So I think some of the work was also not in a traditional way sitting in the office, but you were somewhere all around the world uh, visiting clients or events using our system. So I think, as I said, the distinguishing between what is hard work and what was in between work and private life was very blurry. Mm -hmm. And that's why, I mean, it was a very intense time, but I think we didn't really come to a level where uh, we felt that uh, yeah, it's influencing health or our social life in a very dramatic way. And probably also the chief entertainment officer, part of the CEO's job, as you mentioned before, helped in, in that way. Yeah, I mean, like always, I think uh, working hard is a natural part of all entrepreneurial activities. But if there's no uh, contrast to it and no uh, non-working element in your in your regular day, then I think uh, you miss a big part of the whole entrepreneurial journey. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, I think that's also one of the key functions of the founders and the CEO, that you also entertain your people. And entertaining doesn't mean that you just incentivize them uh, financially, but you also give them some meaning and inner uh, satisfaction by the work they're doing. Do you have an example how that showed at Amiando? I mean, there we had uh, the 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 advantage that we had a lot of very uh, famous partners. I mean, for example, we worked very closely with Facebook. Mm -hmm. So the official launch of Facebook in Europe uh, was in our office in Munich. So Mark Zuckerberg flew to Munich uh, to officially launch um, Facebook in Europe. So we gave him a nice lederhosen, which is uh, <laughs> the present you receive when you launch something in a uh, in, uh, in, in Bavaria. Mm -hmm. So we had, for example, already in the early days of Facebook, we had Mark Zuckerberg several times in our office, which was uh, great for PR, sure. great for our employees, and also business-wise for us, very relevant. We were the first and only uh, non-Silicon Valley partner of Facebook Connect back then. Mm -hmm. We were at the first F8 uh, as one of the very few non-US uh, uh, visitors. So that was one of the examples. I mean, we were quite a big and close part of the early days of Facebook. And then some uh, of clients like Facebook became extremely successful and we were business-wise part of these developments. Mm -hmm. So I think that gives a lot of motivation uh, to your people. We had a lot of very big events using our solution. So our employees were part of uh, very uh, unique event experiences all over the world. So I think this gives you a lot of um, additional incentive, also something people are really sharing, not because it's their business, but because they, they like it as a private individual. Sure. So I think that's the big advantage if you do something in the inter entertainment space, mm -hmm. that your underlying uh, business uh, is one thing, but also the side effects of meeting interesting people and having... Uh, unique experiences, perhaps with clients or, or, or other um, stakeholders is something which makes it very appealing. I think that's a, a very great story to, to hear how these things then actually show in, in practice. How did the connection to Mark Zuckerberg happen? Did you have like one of your co-founders, did one of them have a personal relationship? Question. Or? Honestly, um, 
Honestly, I don't really remember. I mean, we were doing this ticketing uh, thing and then Facebook also, they started, I mean, it was also in the early days of Facebook, mm -hmm. they started their event functionality. I mean, uh, I remember Facebook when there was literally nothing else than just interacting with other individuals. So there were no event functionalities, no pages, no whatever. And when they started their event functionality, they realized that it could make sense to have a ticketing uh, option mm -hmm. included. And that was the original contact. So uh, and back then, Eventbrite, our biggest competitor, was already existing. But uh, Facebook decided to work together with us instead of Eventbrite, which was great for us. And then, uh, yeah, Facebook became very big and successful. But as I said, in the early days, um, we uh, were part of their offering mm -hmm. and I mean just the fact that uh, they launched their European activities in our office in Munich shows a little bit how close we were. So there are also a few nice photos if you Google for Mark Zuckerberg and Lederhosen and Amiando, <laughs> you will find some uh, nice, uh, nice photos. Yeah. Cool. What did you personally take away from being close to Mark Zuckerberg when he was actually visiting your office? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we met several times and I mean, he's a nice guy, but we were not really friend-wise connected. I think he's definitely very driven and focused on, on Facebook. So, uh, I mean, uh, I, I can't remember any discussion where he's not by uh, side distraction also looking at his mobile. <laughs> so, uh, but it was a good time. I mean, his sister back then was running the PR activities of Facebook. So, mm -hmm. and uh, most of the guys you saw uh, during the IPO uh, at the ring belling were also already part of these days. So uh, you really met the original founding team of, of, of Facebook. And it was interesting because everybody knew that this thing will be big. But I think uh, even ourselves being involved in the very early days, we never expected that Facebook is becoming that big. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were just like all the other tech founders, we were just a group of driven, passionate people, sure. a little bit disrupting the whole uh, social media, social networking space. Mm -hmm. But back then you had StudiVZ in Germany, you had Facebook, uh, MySpace, uh, you had so many other players. So looking back, it's always easy to say that Facebook was the obvious winner, but I think back then it was also just a fast growing tech company in the Silicon Valley with a very driven founding team and a nowadays very famous founder. But besides that, it was also just a group of young people with the passion to change something. Mm -hmm. And that's something which I personally also like in this whole tech space that you meet so many people uh, where you never really know into which direction it's heading, but they sometimes really change the world in a massive scale in a very short time. And I think that's something which I personally still like about this whole tech industry that uh, even a 20 year old something guy from somewhere is able to really change a whole industry. I think that's not happening uh, everywhere else, anywhere else. Yeah. You also just said that everybody thought that Facebook will be successful. What made you guys think that? Or was it the strong traction that they already brought from the US over to Europe that made you think that? Was there certain key indicators that you looked at that actually led to that conclusion that Facebook will be successful? Yeah, looking back, it's always easy to say. I mean, back then when we were, for example, at this first F8 uh, event of Facebook, um, it was already obvious that they're very tech driven. I think they also had some kind of hackathon in a time where hackathons were not that obvious. And uh, also the people, the, the, the first employees, you realize that they were all, some of them came from big consultant uh, companies, other ones already had very successful careers. So it was really also about this passion to change something. Uh, but I mean, honestly, looking back, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg was one of dozens of young founders. Uh, we worked together back then. And yeah, now it's easy to say that it was obvious that he became so, so successful. But I think, uh, as I said before, there are a lot of smart people and some of them become extremely successful. Other ones fail. Mm -hmm. I think it's also a lot about timing and luck. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, yeah, it was definitely not that obvious that uh, the whole thing is becoming so big. 
So the conclusion out of this would be, you can sort of tell if somebody's onto something, but you cannot really determine whether this will be a huge success or not. Because exactly, that's I mean, impossible. otherwise it would be very low, uh, boring, right? Exactly. Um, and I think personally also timing is extremely essential. Mm -hmm. I mean, Facebook did what a lot of platforms already did years before. I mean, also at usgang.ch we had chatting, poking, commenting, whatever in, I think we implemented it in 2001 or so. Mm -hmm. So years before Facebook really uh, uh, appeared, but back then nobody was willing to share his real identity. There was not really the same willingness to share information. Now, uh, a few years later, Facebook came with a few others and I think they did a lot of things far better than others. Mm -hmm. But the timing when they started their whole social networking activities was just perfect. So that's why I think, but that's the case uh, with most successful companies, you have to really find or be in the right time frame to become real successful. Besides the timing, you have also mentioned luck as success factor. What role did luck play for Amiando? Yeah, I mean, real luck is difficult to identify, but uh, I think a lot of the decisions and happenings you normally connect to certain activities are mostly also influenced by luck. So that's why I think uh, luck is always, you can influence the probability that you uh, are lucky, mm -hmm. but I think you can't uh, always influence everything. So that's why I think, uh, I mean, at Amiando, to give some concrete examples, I think it helped that we got a few very respected uh, companies as customers. For example, TED was one of our earlier uh, customers. So all TEDx talks worldwide uh, were uh, organized via Amiando or the Facebook thing. Um, and sometimes I think, yeah, it's just that the people who meet, they match. And it's not always based on pure facts that you start a collaboration. So sometimes it's more like soft factors. So if you want to um, uh, name it luck, that's definitely something which is part of it, especially when you're a small company and you don't expect bigger ones using solutions. I mean, one of our first biggest clients was Le Web Conference, back then the biggest tech conference in Europe. I think they're not existing anymore. And they uh, decided to use our solution and we were honestly not really ready to offer everything we, we sold them. So our programmers had a lot of night shifts to really fulfill our uh, original promises. So sometimes luck combined with uh, certain, not overselling, but uh, self-confidence mm -hmm. to uh, yeah, sell services in a way that they're definitely um, yeah, not at the same level uh, when you sell them, but you know that they were moving into a certain uh, direction. That definitely also helps. And then you created a huge success with the sale of the company for 10 million euros to Xing. Can you tell us and walk us through how did that happen and how did that process look like? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think it wasn't a very big success because um, we were one of the most visible startups in German-speaking Europe. So everybody expected that uh, Amiando will be a 100 million plus okay. Exit and honestly, also personally, we thought that um, there might be a bigger exit at the end. But we were in a situation where Xing, our buyer, was one of our bigger customers. Mm -hmm. um, there was a very close relationship to them. Um, the founders were involved in the company for four years. And originally, we thought, let's do it one to three years and then reach a level where there will be some potential buyers. So we were at the point where we knew that if we want to do an additional financing round, we have to be committed for additional two to three years, whatever. So that's why for us, everything came together in the right way. Um, I think uh, from a looking back perspective, uh, we could have had a far bigger uh, success. I mean, now seeing what Eventbrite and other competitors are doing, um, because... Um, I think we sold it uh, too early. 
uh, because the whole event ticketing business really kicked off a little bit later. I mean, also you see the numbers at Xing, mm -hmm. um, what the, the revenues are out of their event business nowadays. So uh, they definitely made a great deal for us. It was also a nice confirmation that we created a sustainable and long-term business. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, honestly, all, all of the founders had a little bit more ambitious plan. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I said, it's uh, not only about the ultimate uh, price per share you get, but also about uh, what you do afterwards, uh, what learnings you have. So for me personally, um, Amyondo was definitely uh, a next uh, uh, learning curve to decide that I now want to move uh, more into the investment space mm -hmm. after I uh, co-founded and exited two companies. So I think everybody takes his own learnings out of that. And all my co-founders at uh, Amyando are now doing very successfully other uh, things. So I think like with usgang.ch, Amyando was a journey where a lot of smart people came together. And I think we have more than 20 companies which emerged out of the um, uh, Amyando uh, employees so far. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit like the foundation of a lot of other interesting entrepreneurial activities. And still, I think it's a very good story to also hear that, you know, what looks like a big success from the outside does not necessarily reflect that it's also a big success perceived from you, from the inside team. Yeah, it's also a little bit about the ambition. I mean, all the founders of Amiando already had other projects before. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I had my first exit already. So normally you always want to uh, yeah, create something bigger. Mm -hmm. So um, perhaps, I mean, it's still a, a valid number, but uh, let's say from a more ambitious perspective, um, you definitely want to achieve different uh, results. So that's why I think that's perhaps one of the disadvantages becoming older that uh, yeah, you also want to achieve uh, bigger successes because otherwise, yeah, you're not, I mean, that's, I think, uh, human behavior that you always want to overachieve your existing successes. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, you would lose a little bit your ambition, which is, I think, not a very human behavior, right? Absolutely. And then you move to the investment space and later also to the crypto area. And this sort of transition from first time founder bootstrapping everything to nowadays you run crypto finance, uh, HE. Well, actually it's your company uh, come with other people. I mean, I'm in the board, yes. Exactly. And, the yeah. and it's a multi-million dollar company with very well-known people in the board and supporting uh, the company. How did you sort of, how would you describe this, this transition or this evolution also from you personally, from, I, I would say, starting small bootstrapping with 3,000 Swiss francs in your bank account to a multi-million dollar uh, company? And what role did also your personal network play in that regard? Yeah, I think at this stage, it's uh, also a lot about connections. I mean... When we started our first company, we didn't even know what venture capital is. When we uh, started the second company, we had uh, quite well-known business angels and investors on board from day one, mm -hmm. but we were still uh, doing it the hard way. So pitching, doing roadshows, meeting people we didn't know and trying to convince them to invest. And now at this stage, uh, a lot of the activities are based on trust and personal relationships. So, for example, at Crypto Finance Group, we raised close to 20 million so far, but no single dollar uh, from uh, institutional investors. So we only have friends, literally, mm. as shareholders, private individuals, um, which makes it very appealing. Uh, I mean, as long as it works out at the end, sure. <laughs> um, you have still your entrepreneurial flexibility. Um, you have a group of people, you trust in them, they trust in you but uh, you still have a professional relationship. So I think uh, it's a natural involvement that uh, after learning some things, proving that you're able to create uh, value out of other shareholders' money, mm -hmm. that uh, the road to funding, to talent, to the right partners is a little bit a different one than if you do it for the first time. Mm -hmm. 
And that's why, I mean, uh, the chairman of, of, of this company already runs an asset manager with more than a billion assets under management. So, and uh, my other board colleagues also had very successful uh, careers so far, including big exits and board roles at very big uh, multinational companies. So ultimately, I think, uh, again, uh, you want to always somehow increase uh, the success of your entrepreneurial activities. Mm -hmm. And that's why yeah, the level of people coming together at the later stage is normally a different one than for first time entrepreneurs. Um, I think nobody would be here if you wouldn't have had it learned the hard way as a young entrepreneur. So that's definitely part of the whole game. You normally not just pop up at this level, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit, for me personally, it's, a, it's like a natural development. Uh, I mean, there are always also backslashes and not everything works out as planned, but uh, uh, I think as an entrepreneur, that should be the ultimate uh, development that you somehow try to yeah, achieve more than you already achieved. But with that motivation in mind, there's also sort of no limit. If you always want to have more and more and be more successful, you chase the endless game sort of, right? Yeah, perhaps it's less the endless game, more the increasing impact. Okay. I mean, as I said, in the, my first company, it was just solving a problem I had personally, mm -hmm. which is nice, uh, but I mean, giving uh, information about nightlife activities in the internet um, was a great desire from myself personally and from other young people, but it's perhaps not really changing the complete world uh, in a good way. And uh, now I do quite a few things where I really see a bigger vision behind than just uh, generating higher revenues and a bigger exit at the end. Mm -hmm. So I think the whole crypto finance subject is really part of a big revolution. So bringing blockchain into the financial services world in a fully regulated way uh, could be one of the biggest mega trends in this field for the next few years. So as a side effect, we all hope that it's also a big financial success. But I think the underlying uh, driver is that we really want to change the existing system and bring technology into an industry which is still based on very old fashioned and outdated um, processes. And I think that's definitely, at least from my side, one of the drivers uh, that I focus on companies, industries where there's a huge trigger behind, mm -hmm. which goes far beyond just um, share price uh, uh, focus. Sure. Was this big new trend that you saw rising at the horizon also the main reason why you switched from the web to the blockchain and lately crypto? Uh, environment was that your main driver behind it because you thought this trend is bigger than well, what we have in the from the past for example yeah i mean that's always one of my key drivers i mean in 1999 uh, with the web in 2010 when we started to invest in fintech companies mm -hmm. and then 2012 when i uh, got into blockchain mainly bitcoin back then uh, for me personally i always want to do something which is not yet obvious i mean you miss perhaps sometimes the right timing because you're too early. Mm -hmm. But if you believe in a game-changing element, then you'll normally stick to it if you're not far too early, which you never know. But uh, that's something which um, personally drives me. I mean, also, I mean, uh, I'm a Singularity University alumni. There you really go into the far future. But a few of these things uh, I also look into from an investment side, so space mining and other crazy uh, future industries. And that's something I'm personally interested in. I mean, if somebody is doing something which is already verified and it's just about optimizing, that's great. And I think sometimes you can have a far bigger financial success if you just piggyback on a certain development after it's proven and it's working and it's just about scaling it. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, I always like the the, the phase where it's not yet obvious, uh, even when you have a lot of objections. I mean, in the crypto space, it's definitely not the mainstream philosophy that you say it will replace a big part of our existing system. Um, but that's exactly what I'm looking for. I want to be a little bit before 
other ones and also uh, looking into fields which are not that obvious that they may become a huge industry. Last year in 2018, uh, blockchain and crypto especially had a huge boom. But then towards the end of the year, especially Bitcoin also crashed pretty heavily. Mm -hmm. We have to timestamp this. We are recording the interview in January 2019, just to put that into perspective. Mm -hmm. What does the, the, this price decrease mean for you personally? Is that just a small thing that you don't even notice or don't focus on? Or is that something that you also get a bit concerned about? Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I, as I said, I explored Bitcoin, not as a speculator, but because I was interested in the technology in 2012. So bought my first coins on the $10. So from a pure financial perspective, I'm relaxed. But as I said, that was never my driver. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are so many relevant things happening in the background, which are completely unrelated to the price of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies at the moment. That I personally, I mean, I care because at Crypto Finance Group, uh, the price is uh, our ultimate uh, trigger. Uh, but like during the dot-com bubble, I mean, just because uh, the bubble burst, uh, it's, uh, the, the whole developments in the tech space didn't stop. I would even say that the relevant ones sometimes were really triggered by the bursting of the bubble because there you really had to focus on sustainable business cases and not just uh, spending the money you received after your IPO into some fancy side projects. So I think it's a healthy development. I mean, I completely understand that a lot of people think that after this Bitcoin crash, um, it's the end of, of, of the industry. But I think, I mean, you had exactly the same sentiments already 15 years ago, and we see what happened with Amazon. I think they lost 98% of their uh, value after the dot-com bubble and are now still uh, one of the most successful investments ever, mm -hmm. one of the biggest uh, market caps uh, all over the world. So it's always uh, easy to look back and define what was right and wrong. But personally, I think uh, the focus on the Bitcoin price is a very short-term, very speculative approach and you should really go into a little bit deeper into the tech into the projects into the players joining the whole blockchain revolution mm -hmm. and there we're literally at the beginning and the retail space which was mainly driving this whole bubble i mean they lost now their interest which is okay uh, but i think the real substance will uh, happening now uh, this year and especially also next year so we are in the very early days i think we are Coming back to this example of the whole web development, we are with in between, I don't know, 1998, 1999. So still using traditional uh, modems uh, to go into the slow internet. I think that's a little bit the phase where we're at uh, in the blockchain space. So we already discussed that it's very hard to predict the future and to make assumptions about the future. But nevertheless, I think it's a very interesting question that also our listeners would appreciate to hear sort of your takes on how does the Bitcoin, the crypto, but also the blockchain future look like for 2019, but also beyond that uh, for the next couple of years. What is your take on this, making sure that these are hypotheses and not any yeah. sure guesses? Yeah, I think this year we will see uh, the first real use cases based on blockchain because they are mostly still missing. Mm -hmm. So people talk about the technology, but honestly, I don't normally care about the technology. I, I, I look for business cases where you can earn money. So that's something which is coming. And as soon as we have real use cases, people don't talk about the technology anymore because they just see the use cases and use something because they have uh, something better, cheaper, more efficient, more transparent, whatever. Mm -hmm. So like uh, we use the internet nowadays, I mean, nobody cares about the TCP protocol or anything which is really fueling the whole digital revolution. We just talk about Uber, Amazon, whatever. So as soon as we have the, few, the first real use cases, um, the focus will move away from the technology and all these discussions we have right now mm -hmm. and we focus on companies which really solve problems based on this technology. I think that's the starting point this year. 
And then I think in 2020, 2021, we will see the first real relevant cases. I mean, not just uh, use cases which are valid, but also relevant. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as, because this whole uh, technology is so uh, vertically integrated in every industry, we see startups, we, but we also see very big stock listed companies which are changing because of the power of the blockchain technology. A little bit what we're seeing now with the digital revolution, I think we're also here just in the beginning. Um, when you see the impact on, of Amazon, for example, here in Switzerland, it's still very small. I think that's changing dramatically in the next few years. And that's why I would say after the whole sentiment, which is now more on the blockchain was a temporary phenomenon. It's again the same like 15 years ago with the internet. It will need five to 10 years, perhaps even more to really um, yeah, get the or realize the power of this new technology. But we will see first indications this and especially next year. So we have a very interesting time ahead of us. Definitely. And as I said, as soon as we don't talk about blockchain and the underlying technology anymore and more about the real use cases for it, I think that's normally the tipping point because ultimately, I mean, you have to have people who understand the technology, but from a business perspective, you just have to have real life services use cases which use this technology, but from an end consumer perspective uh, are not really relevant to them. Sure. Before we conclude the episode, I would like to ask you two additional questions. Mm -hmm. The first one is, do you use any favorite tools or gadgets on a regular basis? Could be like your smartphone or you have a special app that you use. Is there anything that comes to mind when you hear that question? Yeah, okay, I use my smartphone quite regularly. So uh, if that counts, no, I'm not really uh, a big reader, uh, honestly. I mean, I, I don't have books next to my bed. Mm. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, the old-fashioned, uh, I mean, back then it was called RSS Reader. So I'm still following uh, quite a few niche blogs and platforms. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one of my main uh, sources of information. Mm -hmm. And it's still interesting that sometimes days before you read it on uh, bigger, more established platforms, you get insights out of these niche uh, platforms mm -hmm. um, same with uh, social media for me personally twitter and linkedin are interesting sources to get insights from relevant people uh, ideally ones uh, i know in person but sometimes also just relevant decision makers uh, so these are a little bit like my my main sources of uh, of uh, of information um, yeah i think watching traditional tv or reading traditional newspapers. For me, that's more like a relaxation entertainment uh, uh, activity, but uh, unfortunately far less uh, something where I can really get something which is relevant for my, for my day life or for my business life. So there you also see how dramatically the consumption of information uh, uh, changed, right? Absolutely. But yeah, I don't have any secrets tools. I mean, I think the best source is always being around smart people. So I invest in companies where there's a subject covered I'm interested in with people. I know they're smart. So normally that's my best source um, to be uh, involved in uh, new emerging uh, fields that I have a small stake in a company. And that's a little bit like my research or access to capital, uh, access to information and brain power uh, approach. And you mentioned you don't read that many books, but are there any blogs or podcasts that you could recommend as resources from your side? Yeah, I mean, I have a very, very uh, niche focus, right? But personally, as a Singularity uh, University alumni, I think there you find a lot of relevant stuff. I mean, uh, you have part of it is public uh, Singularity Hub, for example, where you have a lot of this future exponential technology driven uh, mm -hmm. content and, and analysis. Uh, that's definitely something I can recommend if you're into this field. I think uh, if you're doing something 
in the real uh, world at the moment, it goes a little bit far beyond uh, what you need. But for me, um, looking into singularity university related uh, subjects, that definitely something which personally always opens a lot of perspectives and also gives a lot of relevant inputs for uh, for a lot of my activities in, in, in everyday life. Cool. I could ask you many, many more questions, but I will save them for the second episode. Thank you so much for taking the time to have a chat with us today. And I wish you all the best and lots of success for all Thank your you. future projects. Pleasure and same to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to today's episode. Next week, we will be back with a new episode of the Swisspreneur Show. We talk to Mark about the topic of exits and highlight his two successful company sales. We also talk about the process of actually selling a company. So make sure to tune in again to an all new episode of the Swisspreneur Show next week.